All right, I think it is now a good time to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today um, for this event brought to you by New America and the Public Interest Technology University Network. If you're not familiar in the Public Interest Technology University Network, which you might hear today referred to as PIT-UN, is a partnership that unites colleges and universities committed to building the field of public interest technology and growing a new generation of civic-minded technologists. Today, the network includes more than three dozen higher education institutions committed to developing curricula, research agendas, and experiential learning programs to develop graduates with skills and knowledge at the intersection of technology and policy. My name is Chris Kwong, and I have the privilege of moderating this evening's conversation with four inspiring student leaders in the field of public interest technology. Today's topic is especially meaningful to me, as I very recently was a student myself in the field looking for opportunities and really didn't find any. And so that experience led me and some friends about three and a half years ago to found a nonprofit organization called Coding It Forward, with the mission to inspire and empower students and young people with tech skills much like ourselves at the time and our panelists today to consider social impact in public service. Today, we'll hear from four students and recent graduates from Pitt UN schools, Shreya Chowdhury, Emily Fong, Demetria Mack, and James Sedden, who will share their perspectives and pathways in public interest technology and suggestions that they have for their colleges and universities. As was mentioned, at the bottom of your screen, you should see buttons for the chat and the Q&A, and we encourage you to follow along and contribute to the conversation, ask questions of our speakers. Um, and right now, if you wanted to even introduce yourself to everyone else in the audience and to us, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from and why you're interested in this event. And perhaps if you're affiliated with a college or university, feel free to, to use the chat to share there. Towards the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers, and at which point we'll be joined by two other students or recent graduates, Emma Brennan and Leila Doty, who will join us for that portion. But I guess just to get us started, maybe we can go down the virtual line, um, Shreya, Emily, Demetria, and James in that order for a quick round of introductions. Um, maybe your name, your school, your year, your major, what you're studying, what you're doing now, and maybe a little bit about what public interest technology means to you. Um, Shreya, we'll hand things off to you. Thanks, Chris. Hi, I'm Shreya, I use she, her pronouns. I am a rising junior at Olin College. And right now, this summer, I am participating in the Princeton Center for Information Technology and Policy Summer Fellowship. So I'm placed at the New York City Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, and I'm working on the digital and design team, working to build digital services to support all New Yorkers. Uh, I'm an engineering with computing major at Olin. To me, public interest technology is a way to look at technology that recenters humans and people at the focus of everything that we do and posits that technology should always be created and used at the benefit of people and not to hurt them. Great. Um, Emily? Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Fong. Um, I am a recent graduate of New York University's Skousen School of Individualized Study. Uh, while there, I created my own major called Decolonial Computing to focus on civil rights and justice, as well as technology and how those things intersect. Um, I now work at a startup based in downtown Brooklyn called Propel. We've, um, our primary product uh, helps low-income users uh, who are on food stamps or other government benefits um, manage that windfall and accrue more uh, or invest in more wealth. Um, and public interest technology to me is, you know, with the caveat that technology is a tool, um, is the philosophy that we can use that tool to upend the social structures that cause injustice in our society um, and can do a lot more and scale impact as much as possible. Great. Um, over to you, Demetria. Hi, my name is Demetria Mack. I am from Brooklyn, New York. I currently attend Howard University, and I am a, a computer science major and a rising sophomore. Um, so I just wrote everything out so I won't forget. Uh, I am work this summer. I've been working with my professor to get a group, a pit group implemented in our school, so we can be able to create a website that would be useful for all the um, 
students in our school and it that kind of um falls into why i'm interested in pit to begin with and that is because it promotes inclusion so a lot of people think technology in order to be involved in um pit you need to solely be a a tech um like a computer scientist or someone who's working in the technical field but i want to show that all a, a bunch of different um work sorry that was my dog a bunch of different um people can work together in order to create inclusiveness and create a better technological world for everyone not just people who are working in the computer science field so fantastic thanks so much and james last but not least hi all uh, i'm james i'm a rising senior now at the university of chicago studying political science and public policy uh with a minor in astrophysics um let me see what else. Uh, right now, I'm like Shreya, I'm working at the New York City Mayor's uh, Office of uh, the Chief Technology Officer, um, where I'm working on the policy team, um, doing vaguely the same things that, that Shreya is, but in a less technical capacity and a more um, sort of legal and policy implementation one, which has been really interesting. Um, and what does sort of public interest technology mean to me? I, I would say, kind of just echoing what everyone else says, um, if I had to put it really succinctly, it would just be uh, using technology as a tool for uh, the public good. Um, in my mind, it's more centered around, uh, at least at the moment, enabling governments um, to sort of use technology to do that, but uh, it can certainly be expanded. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here and being a part of this conversation. Um, obviously, Olin, Howard, NYU, and U Chicago are four of the over now 30 institutions that are part of the Public Interest Technology University Network. And hello to everyone um, tuning in from wherever you might be, um, many other Pitt UN schools, um, folks who are interested in learning more about what New America and what I think most importantly our students are doing. Um, that's a space that I feel particularly passionate. So I think, Demetria, one thing that you mentioned and I heard in many other um, of the introductions as well is this focus of public interest technology being more than for folks who are studying computer science, for people who know how to code and, and building a big tent around um, what technology means. And so I was wondering maybe if you could share since you being a rising sophomore, you're the youngest one on, on the panel, um, share a little bit more about kind of what got you interested in kind of public interest technology and why that wasn't necessarily just kind of one particular field or department? Well, um, as we like, as the world has, has been evolving, especially in times now, it's important that we use technology for a better purpose than what we're doing um, already. So um, I shared the story when I uh, first met with everyone on the panel. So I, um, began like getting interested in computer science because I watched a TED talk from a woman, her name was Joe Bellamy. Bellamy, I'm, just, I'm sorry if I mispronounced her last name, but she was talking about how the biases and algorithms and how that negatively affects people. So I wanted to be able to, uh, I got interested in PIT because being able to fix these algorithms and being able to move forward into a more inclusive um, technological All right. I, I think we may have lost. Um, Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm back. This, you're back. No. I'm so worries. sorry about that. My, I, everything just froze. At, was this something on my end or? No worries. You were um, talking about um, Joy Boom Weemies. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, after I watched that TED talk and she started talking about the biases and algorithms and how that negatively affects um, African American people, I just started thinking about how can we use technology so it can be inclusive to everyone and not just a specific group of people. And I feel like with Pitt, it promotes that in like inclusiveness to show that if you work in um, fields such as public policy, you can have a direct influence on this that can go on to affect, um, to positively affect a group of people rather than the um, majority, which is um, white men. So, yeah. Definitely, and I think we've seen a lot of that um, in recent discussion as well, that, that has come to the fore in terms of how technology kind of perpetuates um, certain types of bias and oppression. Um, there are a number of great um, readings and 
works that, that I would recommend everyone check out. Um, but I think what, what's really impressive to me is how public interest technology is not a department. New America and the University Network are not trying to just create a public interest technology department, but building bridges across disciplines. And Emily, I think one thing that you mentioned is that you um, you built your own major, basically. You, you kind of looked at what NYU had and said, hey, I don't necessarily see a home in any one department. And maybe if you could just share a little bit more about what went into decolonial computing and maybe some of the ties to the conversation around public interest technology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to your point about kind of building bridges between disciplines, Gallatin is a school that really kind of specializes in that. Um, the focus at Gallatin is kind of individualized learning and that you build your own curriculum as a student. Um, but when I came into school, uh, that space was very much a humanities um, performing arts kind of space. Um, I, that definitely was the right fit for me initially. Um, I came into college with a really strong interest in justice and civil rights, um, but wasn't quite sure how to scale that and which direction to go. Um, and so I ended up taking a couple of computer science courses that really um, had an interesting spin to them. So specifically an angle on um, creativity um, and literacy and language. Um, and I kind of realized like, wow, that is a really impactful and powerful tool um, for addressing a lot of the inequities um, that affect so many people. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, the computer science major itself was really useful for that to understand how it actually worked. But I felt like I didn't necessarily have a great um, understanding of, or a foundation, let's say, um, for the broader inequities in our society. Um, I knew they existed, didn't know how they manifest necessarily. And so humanity studies, uh, specifically in post-colonialism, feminist studies and critical race theory, really formed the backbone of that broader understanding. And I was able to take what I understood and saw in the technology industry um, into these fields and realize like, okay, here's an explicit problem of inequality um, or oppression or alg sorry, algorithmic oppression, like to what Demetria had talked about. Um, and here is how technology exacerbates or can help address this problem. And so um, traditional humanities studies provided like a really wonderful bridge for me to be able to enter technology in that way. Great. I, I think one of the parallels that we're seeing is kind of finding a home on campus for, for the kind of intersection that, that you're really passionate about. Um, and Trey, I know that's something that you've been doing a lot at Olin and would love for you to, to share with everyone some of the work that you've done around building communities and, and creating opportunities for, for your peers and how at Olin especially that has been a, a student driven um, endeavor. And I think fitting for, for our conversation today about student perspectives and pathways, you, you didn't wait for an administrator, you didn't wait for maybe necessarily someone to say, okay, we're gonna do public interest technology. You kind of just jumped in and, and helped start a, a grassroots movement. If you could maybe share a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, something that Emily said earlier really struck, like talking about how public interest tech is a philosophy of how technology can be used to upend social structures. And I think that that really connects to my conception of public interest tech and the really the reason that the organization that I helped create at Olin is student driven because I think fundamentally public interest tech is about empowering technologists in their responsibility and ability to serve the public interest and to help people. And basically when I came to Olin, I think I was actually at kind of the opposite place as Emily where I knew a lot about technology and was interested in technology. And I like sort of generally knew that I cared about social justice and cared about civil rights, but I had no idea how to intersect the two. And I ended up um, basically kind of falling into public interest tech by connecting with one of my professors, Erhard Graf, who really wanted to create a space at Olin to engage students with public interest tech and introduced me to the term. So I connected with a few other students and just basically through our shared passion and wanting to find this space for ourselves that didn't exist yet, we ended up creating a space for other students. So the group that we created is called Pint. It's a community for public interest technologists. It's all about learning and growing as public interest technologists through authentic, meaningful, embedded experiences. So a couple of our capstone programs are um, a pro bono consulting clinic for nonprofits that are working to serve the public interest and an undergraduate summer fellowship that would embed Olin students in 
public interest organizations for the entire summer. So both of those experiences are fundamentally about giving students a chance to authentically practice as public interest technologists and gain the skills that they may gain in other places in the Olin curriculum, but never connected as deeply within the framework of public interest tech as in Pint. That's fantastic. Um, and I, I follow the work that Pint has done um, and really I think the fact that it's student driven and it just speaks to so much of what potential there is for, for conversations for public interest technology. Because I think one of the things that we've heard um, through our work in Coding at Ford is a lot of students are interested in thinking about the public interest and interested in technology. And too often they think that those have to be mutually exclusive. They, they have to pick one or the other. And so to break down that awareness gap and to see their peers, um, I know we have a lot of students tuning in. So hopefully, I think all of your stories are going to be really inspiring and showing people that, hey, they're not alone. You're not weird to think that I want to use technology as a way to um, improve our communities and in the world that we live in. And I think to the point back about interdisciplinary, one question for you, James, before one um, that I'll post to everyone. You come from more of kind of a policy background, um, less of a, a hard technologist. And so I was wondering kind of from you, Chicago, like how was tech policy something that you had always been interested in or is that something that systems or something that you discovered on, on campus that led you down this path? And now you're working um, with the mayor's office of the chief technology officer in New York. Can you share a little bit more about how you got to where you are? Sure, yeah. Um, I think the answer to that is sort of like mixed. I would say uh, to some degree, I've always been interested in both technology and policy, um, sort of as separate entities. But I think one of the things that really linked that in my mind for me um, was a class that I took called AI for Public Policy at the university, um, where uh, the philosophy of the class was not so much of um, learning how to actually like implement um, uh, artificial intelligence systems, machine learning systems, et cetera, but how to actually like judge them and um, from sort of an abstracted standpoint, taking one step back, um, learning like what uh, my professor called the player skills. I had to look at the notes again before um, I, I came here today, uh, just because I figured it'd be useful. But um, the, the general idea is, as long as you know how to um, judge something and ask really um, useful questions and, and understand the system from a broad standpoint rather than a, a specific technical standpoint, um, you can kind of still get to a level where uh, you have some understanding, and, but even more usefully an ability to um, actually put them into practice um, and, and evaluate them critically. Um, I think that sort of approach uh, from that class I've taken out a little bit. Um, so obviously, like you said, I have a bit more of a policy background, um, but I've tried to, while, while I've definitely tried to gather more CS skills um, at the university and sort of outside, um, I would say I sort of come out with a, with a deployer mindset where um, I want to know, you know, I, I want to understand it, but maybe even if I can't uh, do every, every little bit of it, um, if that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so I know we have a, a captive audience here, many of whom are Pitt UN liaisons, faculty, staff, administrators who are really, I think, ready as, as the school year kicks off, albeit in, in a fashion that I don't think anyone anticipated um, until very recently. Magic wand question. If you had a magic wand and, and you could suggest that your college or university or kind of the prototypical college or university did one thing to support students like you um, in public interest technology, what, what would that be? Kind of, um, Shred, why don't you, you start off? Yeah. So I think I'm going to cheat a little bit since this one thing might be actually quite big. I think probably the simplest way to describe it is that if I could imagine a dream world for public interest technology, it would be a world where public interest tech is legitimized in the way that every other field is. If you look at traditional computer science, for example, there's a pretty clear pathway when you enter college. You can say I'm going to declare a major in computer science. I know that I can go to my career counselors and say like, I want to do an internship related to computer science and they will have a list of options that you can explore and there'll be opportunities for postgraduate education as well. Like the journey that you have to take to go from wanting to be a computer science to becoming a computer scientist is super clear. 
And I think that in my experiences, I've kind of had to craft that experience for myself. And it would be absolutely amazing if that sort of thing existed for public interest tech. But also saying that, like, if I have a magic wand, I think I can be a little bit bolder. That would just legitimize public interest tech as a field like any other field. But I think what's special about public interest tech is the fact that it's so necessary as a field to exist because it's all about interacting with the real world and shaping the world to be a better place. So I think that in my mind, public interest tech would be not just a separate major, but woven into every other part of the curriculum that students go through as well. So all students get to understand what public interest tech is. And in every single experience they have in public interest tech, it's an embedded experience that engages with real partners and real people. Because in my opinion, people wouldn't actually learn public interest tech otherwise. Yeah, I guess just to, to dig in a little bit deeper, you mentioned kind of various things that um, drive legitimacy. And so I'm going to constrain the power of your magic wand and say, if you had to, to pick one thing, would it be classes? Would it be an internship program? Would it be career services? What do you think would be kind of the lowest hanging fruit that maybe a college or university could, could focus on? I think probably the lowest hanging fruit is career services, since in my experience, when I realized that I wanted to go into public interest tech, I definitely tried Googling public interest tech jobs, and there were sparse and very confusing results, because I think that many careers do fall under the umbrella of public interest tech, but they may not necessarily name themselves as such. So it became a lot more of an involved process of trying to understand, like, okay, what are the causes that I want to contribute to? What are the organizations that are working in those causes? How do I find my way into those organizations that may have really high barriers of entry for an undergraduate student who is still learning and developing skills? So I think that if there can be additional support for that, since that was a pretty intimidating process to go through alone, that would create a huge impact. Great. Um, Demetria, um, so what I think we should focus on mostly is the classes. When James mentioned how his, um, how he had to take a class that was um, based on like having an understanding of like technology, I think that would be a very good um, thing to have um, in order to make like a uh, pit more known in schools, mostly because we, a lot of people like myself, you have to take classes according to your track and you have to graduate with um, a specific amount of classes, but most of these classes do not go around the, uh, don't give you a like morally holistic view of how you can implement the values that you learn in these fields into the real world. So having more classes that teach you about, um, mostly for me specifically, as being a computer scientist that teach me about the um, morals that you're supposed to have, not only for um, a computer science and the things that you're supposed to follow within your profession, but how you can apply these morals into making sure that you're giving, you're um, being fair and making sure you're making a, a programs that are um, available to everyone. So having classes that, and also that um, having different classes also um, feeds into like the interconnectedness that is like uh, something that is heavily promoted through Pitt and showing that inclusiveness and showing that you, just because you may be like a, um, like on a pre-law track, for example, doesn't mean you can't take classes in computer science because you never know how that can benefit you in the future. So just having these classes just so people can understand and see, just because I'm not specifically a computer science major, I could contribute to, contribute to this in the future if I have an, an idea on how um, um, these processes work and vice versa for computer scientists, having, taking more of um, more classes that teach them about like, morals and how they can um, make um, uh, programs that are um, helpful for everyone and not just themselves. James or Emily, magic wand wishes? Sure, yeah. Uh, I would also say classes. Uh, I think like sort of uh, both of you guys. Um, I just wanted to touch on something really quickly, what uh, Demetrius said. I just wanted to clarify with the class, um, part of the point actually was to uh, talk about the sort of the pitfalls uh, that can, technology can fall into um, as you kind of strive towards equity. So um, very specifically, actually, like, you know, what kinds of training sets are you using? Um, where's the data coming from? Things along that lines. But um, on a more broad note, uh, I was also struck by uh, what Shreya said um, and sort of how 
public interest technologies a lot about like how technology interacts with the world and um, shapes and is also shaped by it at the same time. Um, I think that's a really current process. And uh, one of the things that I would bring in from this past Zoom quarter, um, as I think we all call it, uh, is a class that I took, um, which was sort of a pop-up class um, about COVID-19 and government response. So it was a very um, sort of in the moment um, kind of class. And it was policy heavy, not exactly relevant to, to this topic. But I think that style of class is really interesting. Um, the professors were really excellent um, at both like teaching us and creating sort of like a broader research project um, as we navigated through it ourselves. Um, I think there were a lot of really interesting um, just like broad research potentials and especially as we go into uh, another quarter of kind of unknowingness. I think um, any professors on uh, on this call would be it would be really useful if even like for a couple of weeks you, you took like a couple of weeks and just did like a project um, with your class about something incredibly current um, like walking through the research process um, having some sort of end product at the end um, i think that was really really interesting um, and uh, i think that kind of broadly reflects public interest technology yeah dimitri one thing that i wanted to say and i actually mentioned this to my professor a lot of people in my uh, class, we actually mentioned this to uh, our professor's uh, possible uh, final project. Uh, I know my professor, she's on the line, so hi, Dr. Zazie. Um, just having uh, us, like, we had to take um, a final, as um, most people have to do, and it was like a written, but I think it would be important for us to actually create um, programs that not only are suited for computer scientists, but like, um, I guess, that are not only uh, are relevant in this computer science world, like, just creating programs that can go out to help um that can connect with other fields such as uh public policy or even um uh met like the medical field just having these um projects that allow us to connect with other fields just so we can see um just because we are a computer scientist we can also go into other fields and have and use our talents to make things to make great things happen in those fields too so Definitely. I think seeing the real world applications of um, the technology that is being built and having that be more than delivering food to your door five minutes faster or in the next photo sharing app. But James, as you were saying, maybe how technology has been used to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we're seeing great organizations like the United States Digital Response stand up um, in response to that. And I think one of the the through lines is this experiential learning. And it sounds like each of you had an experience where you saw an application into kind of the real world and not just building technology for technology's sake. And you said, hey, this was really meaningful. I'm, I'm kind of hooked. And I know me personally, that was also my entry point into public interest technology was I took a class at a Harvard Kennedy School called um, Tech and Innovation in Government taught by Nick Sinai. And, we, it was a field course where we actually built projects for real clients and, and you got to see the impact that that had. So I think it sounds like there's a consensus here is like, how, how do you get students to see the applications beyond kind of the end of the unit or the end of the midterm that, that you'll take um, several weeks into the semester. Um, so one thing that I think has been really interesting is the resources and kind of working with faculty, um, working to kind of explore these interests that you've had. And maybe Shreya, we can start with you in terms of finding, you mentioned that you've co-created Pint with uh, a faculty collaborator. How have you been able to, to I guess, inspire people to, to this vision? Did you start with the students? And I think there are a lot of students on the line who might be really interested in saying, hey, this is something I'm really interested in. Like, what, what should I do next? And I know you're working on a playbook of sorts. So maybe you can give people a, a sneak peek. Yeah, so I think that the process for us at Pint was a little bit unruly and complicated and definitely full of experiments, um, which is a great way to learn. I think that a few of my major takeaways was that we were incredibly fortunate to find a faculty member who was so willing to support us so early in the process. Like Earhart has continually acted as a champion for Pint and not in that he is trying to determine what Pint is and define it, but rather that he's trying to give us the mentorship and guidance and space that we need to run those experiments and try things out and see what works and see what doesn't work. 
In terms of reaching students, I think it was a kind of a two-tiered approach. So first, there was the matter of creating the space that we knew that students wanted. Students at Olin have, have been asking for direct experience working ethically with technology for a long time now. And it was just a matter of having access to that space early in their um, careers at Olin because there are capstones and courses that students can take later on, but those are only for juniors or seniors. So we wanted to be really deliberate about creating a space that would engage first years as well and sophomores because we know that that is an important part of creating a pipeline into public interest technology. I think the second tier was actually just um, hosting a ton of community engagement events to help others in the community, including staff and faculty, learn about public interest texts. We've run like probably over some large number of speaker events, engaging alumni and other professionals in the pit field and um, hosting like a book club so people could read books that are related to public interest tech. So I think a lot of the, a big problem with pit is because it's such an emerging field, people may not really understand what it means. Public interest tech in itself is kind of an opaque term when you hear it. So a lot of our work has also been about demystifying the term and helping people see how they can connect to it. Definitely. Um, I think one thing that, that has come up a lot in recent years is the drive to embed a lot of ethics into technology, into computer science courses, and really curious to hear whether that's something that you've seen at your universities. Um, has it been well done? Have you seen kind of an increased focus of how technology, I think, had at one point this utopian vision that technology is a rising tide that lifts all boats, but we've seen time and time again that that's not the case. Um, has that been something that your universities have addressed and how, if so, how? Sounds like our universities could be doing some more um, in vetting of ethics. Um, and I will, I will throw a quick plug. There are two great programs. One is the Responsible Computer Science Challenge, which is run out of the Mozilla Foundation, um, helping and, and providing funding and resources for, for colleges and universities to do that and sharing examples where that has been done really effectively. And I think one example that I will point to is the embedded ethics um, curriculum that is a partnership between the computer science and the philosophy departments at Harvard University. And, and they have actually embedded ethics into a wide range of computer science classes and not just kind of the traditional machine learning um, class where you'll hear about kind of biased algorithms and um, input output of data. So I guess maybe one or two more questions before we invite um, Emma and Layla to join us as well is beyond um, technology and beyond the computer science classrooms, really curious to hear about what other skills that all of you think are really important for public interest technologists to develop. Um, yeah, that might be academic, it might be professional, it might be a little bit both, but for the students online who, who might be interested in saying, hey, I want to be doing, Emily, what you're doing and, and supporting low-income folks, or I want to be working um, at the city level, or I want to be working in an organization that is thinking about public interest technology. What skills should they develop? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to, oops, or Emily, feel free. Um, I know we haven't heard from you. Yet. No worries. I'm happy to jump in on this one. It's kind of like something that I've definitely been learning in the last year or so. Um, I think the nature of public interest technology, and James and Shreya can probably speak to this in terms of the policy work, is that it is very much interdisciplinary. Um, I think coming from the technology side, um, there's not necessarily a huge emphasis on, emphasis on building holistic skills as you're kind of proceeding through um, a very technical major, through no one's fault of their own, obviously. Um, but in terms of like being able to communicate with non-technical stakeholders, like um, as a product manager, you definitely have to, you know, there's some emphasis on put on being able to speak engineer fluently, but can the engineer speak business? Can the engineer speak government? Um, and so understanding like where you're being jargony, how do you communicate and how do you build consensus has been really, really important. 
Yeah, kind of to build off of that, I think a lot of what it requires to build literacy in government and in business and other fields is to have an approach to technology where it's less about actually building the technologies. I think that's kind of the easiest part of public interest tech, but more about engaging with all of the questions that might surround that technology. Like who is going to be hurt by this piece of technology? Who is going to be helped? Where the systems it's going to interact with? Who are the people that need to support this technology in existing and, and working the way that we want it to? And those are questions that are often not asked in technical classes. Like we aren't asked to think about the people really. So I think that speaking directly to faculty um, who are listening, who are teaching technical topics, I would encourage you to think about how you can introduce those questions into every single thing that your students do and empower them to think about those questions and realize that probably those questions are, the answer to those questions are gonna be more questions. But I think it's critical that public and technologists are comfortable with questions and navigating spaces that feel ambiguous. And um, I just definitely like to echo what, what Trey was saying um, and certainly what Emily's saying as well. I think um, something that's really interesting to contrast between um, the place that I worked uh, or the place that I interned uh, this past summer and um, working at uh, New York City now um, is the difference between private and public um, in you know who has to uh, who has to sign off and, and what the incentives are. Um, I'm guessing Shreya has also probably heard this um, since uh, I got some advice from uh, someone in her office uh, on this exact topic. Actually, um, she probably knew who I'm talking about. But um, I think one of the one of the really interesting things uh, to learn is the challenges of policy implementation. Maybe I'm biased because uh, as a as a public policy major, but the number of stakeholders who need to sign off on something and the incentives around those stakeholders to sign off is completely different um, between private and public. If you want to go into uh, public interest technology, I think it would be incredibly useful to say the least to understand um, what change means in, in different organizations, um, whether it's the incentive for change or the incentive against change, I suppose, um, and then kind of things around accountability as well uh, in, in private versus public. You're not accountable to anyone really in, in private corporations, but um, well, that's not really true, but, uh, but sort of is. Um, and, uh, but I think in the public, you're, you're accountable to the public and, you know, seeing your name on a newspaper the next morning is really not, everyone wants to avoid that. I think a lot more than, than in private companies. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I also, uh, I just wanted to add, um, I also think it's important, like, speaking to what Cheryl was saying about the teaching ethics in, um, our cl in the classes, like I remember when I had to read my uh, textbook um, that was assigned to me for my um, computer science class this semester. And there was a small section on ethics, but they didn't talk about how these ethics go beyond the technological like um, implementation. And I think it's also important for um, Pitt to go into uh, low income areas that are primarily um, uh, minorities, because we obviously know there is like a diversity deficit in many of these fields that we that Pitt like um, is um, uh, that Pitt like acknowledges. So I think it's important to get to like train these kids, um, train like especially Black and Brown students from early about Pitt and how they can um, what they have to offer to the um, to Pitt and how they can um and just. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm trying to think, like, process everything that I'm saying, and just getting them interested in it and showing that you're working with the younger generation, and to, because they're going to be the futures who have to, um, like, live, carry on the um, lifehood of um, Pitt. So I think it's important to reach out, especially to minority students, because you get a different um, view and get a different group of people who get to contribute to this organization. Definitely. I think building broad coalitions and recognizing that technology as a tool has not been accessible to a lot of communities. Um, Dimitri, like you mentioned, black and brown communities and how public interest technology might be a, a vehicle for us to increase diversity and equity um, in the technology industry, I think is one thing that we've seen. And James, to your point about um, understanding how work gets done in government. I know that's something through Coding It Forward, a lot of the students that participate in our fellowship programs find is that the hard problems are not the technology problems. They're the people problems, the process and the policy problems. And I think one thing that I've seen from really successful public interest technologists who I admire is one kind of 
the ability to kind of cut through red tape and we like to call um, students bureaucracy hackers or um, and trade to your point about kind of building empathy for who, who's going to be using the technology and recognizing that technology is not neutral. Um, and so I guess one last question before we welcome um, from me and I'd love to, to have a conversation since I think all four of you are in different points in your academic and, and professional trajectories is the idea of kind of what you hope to do um, kind of with the skills, with kind of the backing and everything that you've done in the public interest technology space in terms of careers, in terms of internships. Um, what is kind of your dream of like how you want to create impact? I know that's a big question. So maybe Emily, if I could throw you on the spot, since I know you, you've you been out of school for maybe a year and a half now and, and you've explored um, internships in government, you've explored what it's like to work in social impact and in public interest a little bit outside. Any reflections on kind of public interest careers? Yeah, so full disclosure, I am a graduate of Chris's program. Um, and so Chris's program in particular really kind of set its fellows up for success in PIT. Um, we got to learn a lot about what people in the field are already doing. Um, but I think the unfortunate thing is that there's definitely still a gap uh, for people who graduate from college and immediately want to enter the field. Um, it's still kind of hard to find your first opportunity. Um, so that's kind of part of where, like to Shreya's point earlier, like the community and career building are really, really valuable tools that if a university has, someone can take advantage of. Um, but once, I mean, I feel like when I've gotten into public interest technology, um, Propel is still a for-profit, but we definitely work alongside government a lot of the ways. Um, I think it is a really unique and challenging space in part because you are solving for so many use cases that just do not exist for um, kind of traditional Silicon Valley companies. Um, the emphasis on inclusivity, on economic diversity, at least in our work, is really, really important um, because you wouldn't be able to be effective or do what you do or be sensitive to the needs of your users without it. Um, and so I think in terms of like next steps and going forward, um, the work in like the benefit space has been really inspiring to me. Um, because in part, I think it is a microcosm of a number of huge problems, Politiz politicization, um, complex systems, uh, not a ton of technical support in those complex systems um, are all kind of uh, finding their nexus in this uh, area of work. Yeah, Demetria. I think it would also be important for, uh, as Obviously, I still have a little while to go before I graduate, but I think it would also be important for the um, recent graduates to come back to their school and speak to the students about how Pitt has affected them and how it has changed them. Because I know me, it would be very inspiring hearing from someone who has just graduated how Pitt has like affected them and how they still want to work with it outside after graduation. So I think that would be something important to do because it's one thing for your professor to tell you that, but to actually hear it from your peers, I think that would be more like influential and want to and drive people who are freshmen and sophomores to become interested in Pitt and hopefully be working to that till they graduate as well. Two thumbs up. Perfect. Well, I think um, now is a great time to transition um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We're really excited to, to dive into many of the things that um, you are curious about. And I think before we do that, would love to welcome um, Emma Brennan and Leila Doty, our two other participants, um, to join us on this virtual stage. That was incredibly well-timed. Um, fantastic. Um, but Emma and Leila, I was hoping maybe that the two of you could also introduce yourselves to the folks um, who are tuned in, I think very similarly, your school, your major, and maybe what you've been up to in kind of the public interest technology space. Um, Emma, let's start with you. Yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Emma. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon in 2019, studying design for environments. And that's kind of about bridging and understanding how to make technology in both digital and physical spaces. And now I'm currently working at the Census Open Innovation Labs, which is nested within the Census Bureau. 
and we work to kind of bridge the gap between community, government, and technology. Hi everyone, my name is Layla. I'm a rising senior at Stanford majoring in public policy with a concentration in science and technology policy um, and also doing a minor in computer science. Um, and I've always been really drawn to public service and policy. And I became really interested in technology policy about a year ago, um, specifically the regulation of AI. And this past year, I've been familiarizing myself with the PIT space as it exists or is beginning to exist on Stanford's campus, um, and also as it exists within government and industry. Um, and this summer, I'm doing an internship, part of the same program as James and Shreya, working on tech policy at the New York City Mayor's Technology Office. So I'm really excited to join the discussion, um, and I will do my best to answer questions that the audience may have with the other panelists. Yes, definitely. Um, there's a question that I think would love to start with um, Emma, you and Layla about um, the skills that you've used from in your internships and in kind of Emma now in your case your career Emma you had went through the same program that Emily did through coding it forward um, did a fantastic job curious about the skills that you and Leila in the CTO's office have used and whether or not you feel like you were properly prepared kind of given your coursework um, to do public interest technology work um, was there anything that you wish you had known going in that maybe your school could have prepared you for? Yeah, I think I was very fortunate that a lot of my design program at Carnegie Mellon focused on understanding complex problems and systems. And I think, although designing is a huge part of that and like the medium of how you actually implement these large scale changes, but I realized that's, to me, that was the biggest problem um, going into government and really trying to understand and break down, like who are the people involved? What are ev everyone's motivations? Trying to build an understanding of that. And um, again, people have mentioned it before, but a lot of the times technology is more of the means um, rather than the ends of the problem. And so if you really understand the context that you're working in and the policies involved, then you can actually implement solutions that have scalable change. Um, I think I'll talk about this later, but I think a really big gap in government right now is um, implementing technology, but not implementing it for long longevity. And so a lot of the times like we'll build technology and different solutions, but they're only temporary. And so I would really advise people to understand and think about how can you incrementally um, make technology that's able to adapt and learn with um, the people using it. So systems level change um, and, and longevity and thinking about that. Layla, how about, how about you? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of approach this question talking about a specific class that I took at Stanford that I think did a really great job of weaving together the, inter the interdisciplinary aspects of um, PIT um, and which has allowed me to approach the issues that um, have come up in the uh, NYC CTO's office um, from like an ethical angle, policy angle, and also technical angles. Um, so this particular course, which I think is a good model for other um, administrators and faculty who are interested in um, creating PIT classes, um, this course um, featured three faculty. One was a political scientist coming from a policy background, one was a CS professor, and one um, was a philosopher by discipline. Um, and so um, throughout this course, we focused on a lot of different issues like automated decision making, um, generalized AI, um, privacy issues, et cetera. And each of the units we attacked from these three different perspectives, which allowed us to really see the way that people in different disciplines approach problems. Um, but also it, it gave us the skills to um, be bridge builders between these, these professions or these disciplines in academia, which tend to be siloed off, which I think is really powerful. Um, and I think that's honestly the future of PIT is, Giving, um, giving students uh, the skills to be build, bridge builders between all these disciplines um, and to attack these issues in these ways. I, I think that's something that we're seeing a lot of is that you need to be interdisciplinary because public interest technology by definition is. And so how can faculty teach, co-teach classes um, across different departments? How can they encourage their students to work on something that might be beyond the pale of one traditional department, but saying, hey, this is really impactful. And so another question from the audience is, uh, you are probably all on campuses where 
the norm or the tried and true path for students who are interested in technology is not to say, hey, let me go work for the mayor of New York or let me go work for the United States Census Bureau, but thinking about um, what is the tech startup that is on campus um, this week or what is the big tech company um, that I might want to work for. And so if you had to kind of convince your friends or your peers who, who are technologists in one way, shape or form to kind of understand the importance of public interest technology or to convince them to be interested, what would you say or how would you do that? Kind of open that up. Emily, go for it. Um, I was fortunate to be around a lot of people who had kind of a really strong justice oriented compass. But I will say, I think that general awareness of the impact of technology has grown a lot. Um, even since before I left school. We saw this with protests on campuses for Palantir recruiting. We saw this with a lot of technology um, companies refusing or employees refusing to say um, that they were going to work on projects that had negative impact or human rights impacts. Um, and so I think these broader conversations are definitely making their way to campuses in a way that maybe wasn't happening before. Um, and in terms of actually trying to convince somebody that this was important, I would definitely try and tie like macro trends to your micro experiences. What does it mean for you to intern at a company that takes really lucrative, but maybe not ethical contracts? Is the work that you're going to be doing even as an intern or as an employee going to be affecting the world in an adverse way? I think most people care about that kind of issue. And of course, to be sensitive about different economic situations, um, not everybody necessarily has the privilege to say yes or no. And so being able to point out like, these opportunities exist, um, they're valuable, and they're not necessarily at odds or at, will put you at a disadvantage in technology um, are really important in terms of spelling out what it looks like, like personally and individually to a person. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I also think it's important, like, um, it's important, like Emily was saying, for, I think we should specifically target the professors when it comes to this, because a lot of my professors and a lot of people who are in uh, College of Engineering, which is the college that I am in, every time Lyft or Uber comes to campus, they tell everyone they send out mass emails, but they should do the same when companies who aren't primarily tech-based come to campus to show them how, that, how technology can be implemented in, in various fields. And by just um, promoting Lyft, Uber, Amazon, Google, it just creates this narrative that we're supposed to stay within these big um, companies and not branch out to like the mayor's office, branch out to working and giving our help to medical fields where it's needed right now, especially in the COVID pandemic. So I think it's very important for our schools and our teachers just to promote and talk to our students about real world things that are going on and how our talents in computer science can be implemented in these different um, fields. So, and also just overall mentioning to people that, because I know a lot of people, um, this may sound terrible, but they go into techno technology fields just for a payout and telling them it's not just about the actual money that you're getting, but the, the way that you're contributing to your community and how you can bring your talents back and help your communities that you may come from. So I think it's just important to teaching people, like just pushing ethics and teaching them, it's not just solely about yourself, especially if technology is an evolving field and it's very important in different um, uh, aspects of life. Yeah, I think mentorship, that's a really great point, Demetria, and I think mentorship has a really big piece of that. Um, being able to like record stories and create like alumni networks of people that have gone through that process and have gone through the experiences of what it's like to work in public interest technology um, and know the challenges with it, but also the opportunities. Um, a lot of the times you have like big tech companies um, creating really strong networks so students connect with them and learn about their experiences and look up to them. And I think if you have that kind of channel through public interest technology, there's a better way to actually bring people and teach them about what it's actually like to work in government. Um, I know for myself, I never realized how much agency you have, even though, of course, you're facing a lot of really different challenges than you would um, at a private company. Um, because a lot of my own work, I'm like more of a specialist. And so I'm able to kind of 
have a lot of control over projects and put in a lot of input because um, there's not as much work that's been done um, with technology and design. And so because there's so much opportunity to create new work that hasn't been there before, um, you do have a lot of control over the work that you do. Yeah, kind of just to piggyback off of that, I think it's been really important for those networks to exist post-grad, but I think it's even more important for them to exist while you're on campus. And that has been definitely a huge thing that um, I and the other organizers of Pint have spent a lot of time putting in. And I think one of my biggest learnings is that, yes, a lot of students really care about this, but they don't have the methods or processes to figure out how their work as technologists can actually help people. And one thing that has been really impactful and successful at Pint has been just creating a space where we can have conversations and learn together about the values around technology and understand our personal values. But I think it's very important to remember that students entering college are still students, still growing. Like I definitely have learned and developed a lot in terms of my personal values and having a space where I can think about my values in intersection with my work as a technologist has been incredibly beneficial because it's not something that is really present in many curricula. And I think that it's really important that we disrupt the narrative that technology is not tied to values and instead introduce values explicitly and give students frameworks for understanding their values. Definitely. Um, I think, sure, everything you just said was perfect. And that's exactly like what I've been thinking. And I think this also starts at just the professors, uh, like professors and like uh, the chairs of like um, the um, colleges that we're in, um, I think they just need to sit down with each other and talk about how can we have our different um, majors and different um, professors work together with one another in order to make a community that's more inclusive for all their students and promotes this. Yeah, definitely. I think to a couple of points um, in the community of, of like-minded peers um, and then Dimitri's point about how can I find opportunities in public interest technology because they often are a little bit harder. Um, I think someone mentioned they, they were just Googling for, for opportunities and, and didn't necessarily find them. And so I'm just going to put a quick plug for, for two things that Coding It Forward does. Um, and I hopefully that are of value for, for young people and, and students especially is we send out a bi-weekly jobs and internships newsletter specifically focused on entry level roles in um, public interest technology and social impact. And so if you're interested in subscribing to that, um, we post internships and kind of entry level jobs, would recommend kind of logging on through and, and subscribing on our website, which is codingitforward.com. And very similarly, we also foster kind of a community of like-minded peers. We have a Facebook group and encourage people to share what they're doing um, called Coding It Forward. And so I think those are two ways that we've seen young people and tried to respond to provide some of the same opportunities and awareness that um, we have seen. In terms of, I think James, there is a question for you, you were talking about earlier about how change works differently in the public sector and in the private sector. And um, could you maybe just share a little bit more about that and what your experiences this summer have um, taught you, maybe as you compare it to a prior internship or kind of an academic sense of just reflecting on what change is and, and how young people can go about driving that? Sure. Um, so to whoever asked this, take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, I come at this from a policy and sort of a political science minded standpoint. Um, so your mileage may vary. Um, but I think the, so, and, and also certainly where you work, I think it, it varies. Um, but I will say, I think a lot of um, change in the private sector is, and I feel a little bad because I am, um, uh, using uh, very much using the material that I had in this conversation with um, from the person from our office. Uh, so you should probably get the credit from this. But um, I, I think a lot of change in the private sector comes from um, the sort of motivation to uh, make money or impact or something along those lines, whatever you want to call it, utility. Um, and so 
what you're motivated by in startups, especially, is the the ability to like really move fast. And so people who um, don't uh, move fast are sort of judged. Um, so everyone wants to move really fast so they don't get judged and so they make money or impact or whatever. Um, I think in government, it's the opposite. Um, everyone, uh, it, from, from an institutional level, um, there are a lot of incentives which slow things down. I think people want to slow things down as well. There are lots of layers above you. And so every layer above you wants to um, basically make sure that they're not going to be in the paper. Um, I, I know I keep saying that, uh, but that means that in, in a nutshell, essentially, um, the 20 people above you in, in a line going down to you are all going to be trying to put the brakes on whatever you're doing. Um, and the more government there is, the more that'll happen. Um, so the harder it is for you to, to change. And I'm sure the people who actually uh, work in and around government on a daily basis can probably shed more light on that. But uh, that's really what I was getting at. Um, I will say also, that doesn't mean that uh, bureaucracy in government is inherently a bad thing. Um, I, it's just a different institutional and incentive structure. Um, and the more that people know about that, uh, the easier it is to, to make change. Um, yeah, maybe Emma, if I could have you react to that a little bit, you've been working in government for, for a little while now. And um, I know the, the team that you're in kind of operates a little bit um, untraditionally, but just reflect on kind of how making change in government, what that looks like. And I think if you could also just talk about, there was another question about um, the types of design projects that you've worked on. Um, I think design is a really important part of kind of the big tent that is technology that doesn't get talked about as much, unfortunately. So maybe if you could just share um, a little bit about that as well. Yeah, I think James, what you were mentioning was really interesting about the speed in which government works versus private industry. Um, and I think I'm just kind of reflecting on my past year working um, with the Census Open Innovation Labs and we kind of act almost like a, a more fast paced environment within government. Um, and I think it's an interesting balance because you're able to kind of make problem um, make products and test things quickly um, while also acknowledging that it takes time to make large incremental change. And I think embracing bo both of those philosophies is really helpful because um, by working quickly, you're able, you're not afraid to make mistakes and you kind of combat the like risk averse um, problems of government where people are kind of afraid to um, take risks and, and do big things. But at the same time, working at a slightly slower pace also allows you to really process and reflect on what you're doing and what kind of impact it has. Um, and that would be my critique of private industry where, um, again, if you're not thinking about the values of your company and um, what are the biases and what you're making and really developing time to test and understand who your users are, then again, there's a lot of limitations with that. So I think trying to find a balance between both is really powerful, speeding up and slowing down. Um, and reflecting. Um, and I guess that kind of, um, I can talk a little bit about some of the work I've done, um, but something I think is a bit relevant is we've done a lot of work with um, how do we kind of bring um, human-centered design thinking into the Census Bureau. And so we developed a program um, to bring in different managers within government, teaching them different human design principles, actually like bring through like the process with them. So we had them um, join up in teams and address like what are the challenges they're facing within the Census Bureau and then actually like create and design solutions um, and approaches to these different challenges and I think that was a really powerful teaching moment for me just to understand um, again change kind of happens from every level and you know if you have leadership that um, has really big ideas and wants to change and you have new people coming in a lot of the times the problem can be the middle where people that have been around for a really long time really know the complex structure of the government they're working in, but also don't have a lot of agency because they've been around for so long. So to me, that was a really powerful project to understand what are their motivations and limitations to then figure out how can we kind of make them feel like they have agency again and activate um, change from that level. So um, again, like, my design work has varied a lot, whether like building products with technology or like trying to build in different systems to help people change. But I think reflecting on the pace that we're working and how much you're bringing in and thinking about who your stakeholders are, who your users are, and what their context is, is very important. Yeah, Emily. 
Um, also totally okay if we want to move on to a different topic because we've talked about this a bit. Um, but I think just to offer kind of a different perspective as we're talking about government versus private industry, um, I think the points that Emma and James are speaking to are really important and things that students should be primed and ready to consider. Um, there are definitely concerns that I had going into private industry that we weren't going to be listening to our users, that, um, that we, our change couldn't scale or impact couldn't scale. Um, and I think I've generally found that to be untrue. I think when we think of Silicon Valley, we think of the Ubers and the Facebooks and the companies that really don't care or not don't care, but really prioritize growth um, over user impact and impact in general on society. Um, but I think at least like in private industry, you also get the opportunity to learn a lot more. Um, when our interactions with government, we've certainly seen a lot of stakeholders who have run a program for 20 years, but have never actually tried to apply through that program. Um, to Emma's credit, I think it's great that she's able to try and, you know, bring that thinking of like, you should iterate, you should try things um, to government. Um, but being in private industry and working alongside government has actually given us a lot of opportunities um, to sort of slide in and be like, hey, we're an outside stakeholder. We've noticed this affects your users. Um, here's a bunch of nonprofits that we work with that also address this problem. Like, how can we get you to talk? Um, and so ultimately, that's mostly just to say that it really kind of depends on where you go um, and what your values are and how they align with where you work. And that can also be the same in government, whether or not um, the agency that you work for is aligned with your values. That's obviously a very complicated topic right now. Definitely. Thank you all um, for, for touching on that. I think another question and a theme that I'm seeing in the responses that we're getting from folks who are tuned in is thinking about this particular current moment that we're in, um, in terms of protests around police brutality and, and racism, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, the coronavirus pandemic, um, scandals in the tech industry, and, and on and on and on. And I think one thing that has come up is that as young people, a lot of these movements are, are fueled by young people. And so I guess a two-part question that I'll put up there is kind of in this particular moment, one of the, the guests is saying they feel like they want to respond by to the inequities in, in our systems by just walking away from both um, and asking kind of where you find hope and where you see hope in, in the systems that you're operating in and in the context of public interest technology, perhaps. And then also thinking about um, how do you see technology promoting social justice and, and that kind of lens to, to public interest technology? Yeah, James. Uh, really briefly, um, and taken with a grain of salt because of my sort of political science background and also uh, my privilege in society. But um, I do find that in government, um, a lot of people who are in the systems are very much trying to change the systems. Um, so I think number one, that should give everyone hope. Now, admittedly, uh, it is the city of New York, so it, it, people who work there tend to think a, a certain way, but um, even within, I think, the offices, um, people are, are constantly trying to push for change that they believe in. Um, so I think that's useful, but I also do want to point out that um, I think, for at least from, from my standpoint, all change is political. So um, when you think about government, the people who are in the leadership in government are ultimately going to um, point the direction that the, the big machine of government is going. Um, and people inside can, can sort of go in their own way. But if you think about it in a, in a purely like vector idea, like leadership is gonna be pointing you in one direction and you can maybe go up or down or like to the side a little bit, but you can't actively completely resist it um, because they have the power and you don't. Um, Awesome. Um, we'll go Layla and then Treya. Yeah, um, just to touch on the first question, I think that was asked about where we draw inspiration from. Um, this might sound like a little cheesy, but honestly, I draw inspiration from the community and um, people like the members that we have on the panel today. It's really, really inspiring to see other like-minded people who are passionate about issues of equity and justice um, at the intersection of tech and policy. Um, so that in itself is really, really invigorating. Um, the second half of the question is harder to answer. Um, I believe it was about how we can address, how we can achieve social justice or work towards it through tech. 
Um, and that's hard because a lot of the tech that we have now has exacerbated or at the very least perpetuated existing inequities in society. So I think at the very least, it starts with reevaluating the structures that we have within our technologies and decolonizing them um, and rooting out the racist structures um, that have been embedded into, into all of our technology. Um, and it's, it's ex extremely important, um, not only because of the time we're in, but because technology is so pervasive in all aspects in all sectors of our economy, um, in all sectors, uh, in all aspects of our lives. Um, so, yeah. Shaya and then Dimitri, we'll, we'll let you chime in as well. Yeah, this is a really hard question for me to think about since I think I've become so aware of the ways that technology can hurt people that I might have actually lost sight of the ways that technology actually can help people if um, created with the right values and philosophies. And I've been really, really fortunate and grateful to have had the opportunity to actually do that this summer at the um, New York City Mayor's office as the Chief Technology Officer. And I think the, the biggest things that I've learned is actually that technology can, as Emily said earlier, upend social structures that create inequities. I think it's all about creating access rather, and I think system like typically private technology tends to bar a lot of people from access to systems that they actually need help to and that's the power of government since the ideally government is supposed to create access so government using technology to actually help people just magnifies that potential to create access and there's like a couple examples from the new york city office in particular like for example the new york city office is making huge strides in trying to make broadband a universal human right which is important all the time, but especially important in the middle of a pandemic. And on the digital and design team, we're making huge strides to try to create infrastructure so that content can be translated easily so that we can get to a point where translation isn't an afterthought and people are not barred from government services just because they don't speak English. But in fact, translation is just the standard and it's as easy as writing um, English content. So I think that there is actual real power in using technology if it is interfacing with governmental systems. And Demetria. I think that we, like everyone that's on this panel, we are the start into making sure that technology is used for good rather than um, malicious purposes because we can go into our communities. Oh my God, we can go into our communities and we can teach people, we can teach our peers, we can teach the students that we went to school about what we know about the ethics that we carry and how we carry that into the fields that we um, work in within Pitt and just teach them and just relaying information from one um, person to another. And I think that would be really important because it's one thing for us to know how we can help, but also sharing that information with others because we want everybody to be a part of this community where we're working for the better of humanity rather than just for um, to make, to expansion, and just to make money. Yeah, um, let's see. I want to be mindful of time and we'll, we'll probably try to get in one or two more questions. I think they're really recognizing the audience and the, the goal of the conversation to provide kind of student pathways and inspirations um, and perspectives on, on your own journeys. And I guess a question that has come in a lot is going back to that, that magic wand question of kind of what would you recommend colleges and universities who recognize the importance but don't know how to um, go forth. Maybe Emma and Layla, we could start with you and hear um, what suggestions that you have um, for, for your schools or for schools in general. And I think we can, we can see what, what comes up. Yeah, I think I, I mentioned this before, but I think a really important piece of this is mentorship. Um, being able to see people um, enacting the kind of um, goals and visions that some students might have is really powerful. And being able to see those people and understand how they got to that pathway um, and being able to work with them is really, really important. Um, and I think that's why I really was impacted by the, the Civic Digital Fellowship that Chris runs because that was almost like a created community where I could meet with fellow peers and talk about technology and ethics and engage in different conversations and learn about what they're understanding and figuring out. Um, because I did come from a design background and I didn't have as much experience with 
technology in the public sector. And so coming into that, there was a lot of information that I didn't know or understand. Um, like, how do you learn about policy? Where do you even start? Um, what are the different conversations and things that people are debating right now? And so being able to get access to a community like that is really powerful and can help continue that energy um, and create and build people together. Yeah, just to um, build off of that, I know this was a point that was brought up earlier, um, but something I think is really pressing is that I ha personally haven't seen much action on is carving out pathways into um, public interest tech careers for undergraduates. I've seen some internships and fellowships um, for, for graduate students at um, certain companies and organizations. Um, but especially as a rising senior who, who wants to go into tech policy, what I feel is really missing are clear examples of both immediate, um, so like entry level jobs and um, near future, maybe mid level um, career prospects. Um, and I think it's, it's a problem that the next job, the next steps into my career are unclear because that can certainly deter other students um, from pursuing this pathway. Um, but so I, I think this is a particular problem for people who are coming from policy and social science backgrounds because, um, you know, not only from my personal perspective, but we need a diversity of people in public interest tech. It's been a recurring theme um, during this discussion. Um, uh, and by diverse, I mean we need across all dimensions of diversity, um, particularly in academic disciplines. Um, and so if we don't have a support for students from all backgrounds uh, who want to come into this space, then I think it's going to be a lot harder for people to find their way into public interest tech. Um, so, so that would be, that would be my point. Yeah, I, I think seeing that really it's 2020 now, if not already, but in probably the next five years, one of the things that I keep reflecting on is every organization will probably be a tech organization in one way, shape or form. And I think a place where colleges and universities is, there's no, there's no, gonna be no shortage of demand for students who are interested in this space, whether it's nonprofit organizations, government agencies at the local, state, federal, um, levels. And so I think one thing that I've seen be really valuable is kind of the provision of funding because students oftentimes have organizations have connections that they want, but um, as has been brought up is sometimes the resources aren't there. And I think the COVID pandemic has hit a lot of organizations that are working where the rubber meets the road, um, particularly hard. And so supporting students in kind of putting money where your mouth is and, and offering students an opportunity to, to spend a summer and get hooked. Um, I think Emma and Emily, at least through the fellowship, um, I think having that one experience hopefully kind of open your eyes to, to the world of the possible. Um, let's see what other questions they, they might have. In terms of, I guess, thinking about we've been talking a lot about building bridges between departments. Um, how do you think that you all and, and us as a public interest technology movement can build bridges to people who don't necessarily identify as technologists? Um, how, how can we kind of bring them into this movement and how can, on the flip side, any advice for people who are trying to navigate kind of public interest technology without much of a, a background? Dimitri, I think you might be muted. No, I just said that that was an interesting question. I was trying to think about our possible response. I guess uh, really quickly, um, just an observation that I've had in the summer. I, I don't know if I can really help with that question, but um, at the start um, through the, the program that um, Shrey and Lila and I are in, uh, we had a couple of, or not a couple, we actually had quite a few guest speakers. Um, so shout out to the, uh, to the sort of pit UN team for putting that together. It was really interesting. Um, but what really, like, I, I, what I really appreciated was the diversity of backgrounds that people had coming into this field. Um, like we talked to um, like DAs and uh, assistant attorney generals. We talked to professors. Uh, we talked to people who had like a, a specific CS background. Um, and I, I think I didn't really appreciate that even like knowing enough about the field to get into it. Um, I, I did not fully grasp the like, various dimensions that you could be, you know, you can be a lawyer, you can be 
uh, vaguely affiliated. You could do like policy enforcement. You could be coding in government. You could be serving between, you know, um, government and uh, programmers, um, various things like that. I think that's, that's something to really emphasize. You can, there are so many positions that you would not think of. Um, they might be sort of hard to get into, but everyone has kind of fallen into them from many, many different career paths and many different skill sets. Um, so kind of internalizing that, I think, in, in sort of the community is, would be really useful, um, or at least in yourself as a viewer. Yeah, I think a lot of people get intimidated when they hear of, when they hear of PIT because they're so much, like they're primarily focused on the technology aspect that's in the acronym. So I think it's just important for us to like to push the, like especially for professors to just push the idea that PIT is not only about technology and whatever you have to offer that could be beneficial to the organization is welcomed with is welcomed and received with open arms. Awesome. I, I think for a conversation today that has focused a lot on building bridges between disciplines and departments on the university campus, recognizing that as a public interest technology movement, we have a lot of work in, in building bridges and, and growing our movement to include. And I think James, to your point and Dimitri's, that is probably my favorite question to ask people in public interest technology is how did you get to where you are? Because there is not one kind of tried and true path. And I think those unique perspectives really bring a lot and add so much value in terms of representing at the end of the day public interest technology represents kind of everyone in in this country and so we need perspectives that are as diverse as that can be um so i just wanted to kind of wrap up um thank all of our panelists here today for for spending some time and sharing their perspectives i think for universities and emma you're talking about human-centered design students are the ultimate users of, of a university and so really encourage um, the faculty, the staff on the call to engage the wonderful students that you have on your campus who are having the similar conversations and, and the same passions and interests that all of our students here today have as well and really engaging them in co-creation about how can we provide opportunities and resources. Um, I know there are many, many resources that were mentioned in the chat um, and rest assured, we will be sending out a summary email that will highlight a number of resources that were mentioned by our panelists, by folks in the audience. And so as well, if any of the panelists were, will be willing to share their contact information or how to learn more about the work that they're doing, that will all be included in the follow-up email. Um, and just two things I think that I will, I will mention is one, I think the unique moment of the coronavirus and the, the fall semester being particularly uncertain. And so I just wanted to mention that the organization that I help lead, Coding It Forward, just launched this week the fall cycle of our flagship initiative, which is the Civic Digital Fellowship. It's a program that both Emily and Emma participated in, um, but we bring software engineers, data scientists, product managers, and designers to work on high impact projects um, with federal agencies. So I think if you're a student and you're looking for a real tactical um, and tangible opportunity this fall um, to create impact and serve everyday Americans, would definitely recommend looking at that as an opportunity. Um, there's so many others um, on campus, more locally, that we will share as well. Um, but thank you everyone for tuning in today. I took so much away from our conversation and I, ho I hope you did as well. Um, we hope to see you at a future event, but until then, good night and be well.